today we're talking Star Wars from 77, A New Hope, and directed by George Lucas, of course. Rotten Tomatoes, critics have this at 92%. The audience have this at 96%. The costume designer for this is John Mello, whose filmography boasts of Alien, Event Horizon, and Empire Strikes Back, to name but a few. And this is my good friend Thomas Felix Crichton's choice from Fleming Never Dies on Instagram. How are we doing today, Thomas? Very, very well, thank you. Happy to be here. Great, yeah, no, great to have you back on. The last time we had you on, I think, was for the military sweater talk, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seems like a, ages ago. Anyway, um, so when you picked this one out of the hat, I was very surprised. Perhaps coming from you, as in, I always hmm. considered you to be the, like, the more tailored, the more regal, and, you know, Star Wars doesn't instantly hit me as, like, a, a tailored film or a buttoned-up film, as it were. But... Please walk me through it. Why, why Star Wars for you? Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge, huge Star Wars fan and, and have been ever since I can remember. It slightly runs in the family. I'm told getting worse with each family member finally ending with me. Um, I am a huge Star Wars fan. And I think I like, love the timelessness of the costumes. Um, so, you know, it's a 70s sci-fi film. If you look at, say, Blake Seven or Star Trek or, or many, many other things from that time, you often see, like, 70s trends, or if you go further back to 60s trends or 50s trends, often they take whatever trend is current and then just push it as far as they possibly can. Yeah. Uh, but when you look at the Star Wars costumes, again, you know, it's, to me, it seems timeless. Um, yeah, he had a real vision, I think, uh, this guy, John Mello, and... What I what he did, I, he did. In, in some, um, and you did more research on him than me, so I'll uh, allow you to take the reins on this. But what I instantly thought when I watched Star Wars again the other day was there was so many films that had come before and after, like you said, that had a real kind of shiny, futuristic look to modern mm. sky fi, and this was grungy and dystopian, and you know, kind of everything looked like it needed a good clean even though it's set, you know, <laughs> really far in the future but so what did you dig up on um on john mello so uh yeah Mello's a he's a military historian uh especially for costumes so he always said his first experience of the cinema really was in 1935 he was born in 31 so it seems a bit early but he had a vivid memory of watching clive of india which is a 1935 film and just seeing the gorgeous gorgeous military costumes um, he did national service himself and then went into kind of costumeering. Um, I remember reading somewhere it was uh, actually a link through a family member he got on and then started doing like the military costumes for more and more uh, movies. Star Wars was actually his first sci-fi uh, film and he was put onto it by a friend who was initially requested, couldn't do it, passed it on to him. Um, so I think when you look at the Imperial officers, it looks really, really military. Mm. But again, if you look at other sci-fi films, often you can look at those costumes and say, ah, okay, that's like a Prussian uniform they've slightly adapted, or it looks like this and they've adapted it. But the Imperial uniforms just look military, but they don't look specifically from a European state. Yeah, they just look really, everyone looks the nails in it, like the Peter Cushing looks really stand up. Everyone looks like they've got like a rod you know, sewn in the back <laughs> jacket, right? So that they all have like this great posture. And yeah, that's something that I did notice was like the uniforms. They had like these kind of, like where the medals would normally be, just kind of mm. weird little yellow, blue, kind of non-distinct little colorings. On yeah. Them. But uh, in the I Eternal guess... Stars universe, those are their rank patches. Like right. They are they? Their career through it, yeah. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Here we go. Now, now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah and most of them uh, sorry go on yeah and most of them are sort of similar color so the the one or two that are a different color again it's supposed to tell you about their service so there's in universe reasons behind all of it but they're all pretty like standard colors i remember you're talking to i think was it lindsay hemming and she was saying how color can date really really quickly mm -hmm. um but again I, I was thinking about it it's the colors of the imperial uniforms they're black they're this kind of army green they're very very timeless colors there's one guy in like an ivory but they're really really timeless colors yeah and uh, in fact the only thing that i thought looked dated was right at the end for the ceremonial walkthrough where they all get their medals and luke skywalker wears this yellow reflective bomber almost <laughs> i thought fuck it hell where did he pull that out from you know because that's the only thing that really yeah, everything else has this 
tundra greeny brown mm. you know earthy type thing but he's been put in something that's the same color as in the navy we call it a gecko suit you it's a survival suit you put on if you're jumping into the sea right <laughs> so okay. he's been given the survival jacket <laughs> Yeah, it's gold colored it will go with the medal um, that makes I sense survival jacket <laughs> that makes sense so have you ever sought out any costumes like this for yourself in either cosplay or personal use the only thing i've got is um like there's a shirt that han solo wears in the empire strikes back and cassian andor wears one of the same design if you look at some of the extras there seems to be like a really common shirt design right. and you're talking to what indy magnoli his name mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and he was talking about how there's no buttons no zips again because it's a timeless thing right so zips would really date it quite specifically yeah, um, yeah. in the real world buttons can also have huge cultural significance um so it's got none of those fasteners and it's just a really distinctive shirt design and it kind of looks okay in the real world i wore it because i went up to the redwood trees in california so those were forests used in return of the jedi as the forest moon of endor but right. i also wear a star wars thing oh and i went to san diego comic-con wearing it but again it's something you can wear if you're out and about it would look like a fashion shirt i guess um but it is a star wars design um it's one i really like nice these are the ones that look like it's got a, an asymmetrical bib that's right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah i've seen those yeah. they're pretty smart well uh i when, when i was watching it the other night i text anastasia a couple of pictures of han solo's red striped uh, mm. fighter pants and do you know what? I actually remember those trousers from ages ago. Obviously, when I'm young, growing up and watching it, yeah. these had like a subliminal imprint on me because I had jeans and I would seek out trousers and jeans that would have stripes that go down the side. So, and yeah. it, it's kind of only like later in life where you figure, oh, yeah, this was actually some, something subconscious after watching this that had a lasting impression on me. And I, I had these pair of... Uh, a brand called Bolongaro Trevor and the the jeans I would actually have the piss ripped out of me for these jeans I always thought they were really cool <laughs> but everyone else thought they were really shit in fact Anastasia made me sell them just a couple of weeks ago it's a shame but I would actually have those trousers and probably still wear them she's vetoed the idea I can't get them sorry Indy can't order them from your site but uh, I don't know could you wear those do you think uh, do you think it would be too cosplay to wear something like that nowadays Maybe. I think we talked before, right, about military costumes. It does have that kind of military heritage of a, a stripe down the side of the trousers. Mm. Like the only trousers I have with a stripe down the side are my, uh, my dinner, dinner suit trousers. Right. Um, right. But the idea of that really is that if you have a, a group of men marching, then it kind of brings out, especially if they're doing the Prussian march, right, uh, then it really draws attention to that. Right? Yeah. It's interesting. But, I, I do want to, I do think that, I don't know if it's because Han Solo and Harrison Ford just, you know, they're, they're mm. so iconic with that outfit that I could, I want to wear. But I guess that's the origins of cosplay, isn't it? You just, you see something on screen, you yeah. like it, you want to wear it. Um, I, I think you just need to tweak it and make it your own, right? You can't just go out looking yeah. like Han Solo because people just think yeah. you're a bit of a dick. Yeah, do it your own color or do it your own style. And then I think it becomes, becomes you, right? So yeah. the in-universe idea is that it's a military honor um that he got with the Corellian navy um and it's a very very distinctive unusual one so you notice it's red in the original film yeah it's yellow in the next two films That's because right. uh when people were chasing him they saw the red stripe and it was so distinctive they realized it must be han solo not just any random human who looks like him it must be han solo it's such ah. an unusual military honor so he switched to the yellow ones which is the secondary honor uh, because it was more common and so kind of had a lower profile nice nice I like that and also, I love like John Mello had a, an amazing one, two, three in his uh, filmography. So going through <laughs> his filmography, like if you start off with Star Wars as your first film straight out the mm. gate, I mean that's pretty that's pretty crazy. He then went on to do Alien straight after that, mm -hmm. and then came back and did Empire. I mean, in yeah. in terms of like if you have like a one, two, three on your resume of of, of massive achievements, I mean they're, they're pretty great. And also, he got his second Oscar for Gandhi. Um, yeah. So he did all the military costumes for that. And there's no shortage of costumes in that film, are there? Yeah, yeah. That's, that is a slog of film, <laughs> but I do, I do remember seeing it. I've only, I've only seen it once and just, spoilers, I remember uh, Ben Kingsley getting shot at the end. I was like, ah. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know that was coming. I was, I was very young. <laughs> yeah, that's a, 
that's amazing. And Event Horizon as well. I know we're going off the grass a bit, mm. but it does. I think it's like when you realize someone has scored quite a few films that are similar to each other, like Alex Silvestri mm. doing Predator, and then you go, and then you listen to Back to the Future, and you hear some of the same crescendos that he hits in the music scores. You go, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, this guy did that. And yeah. it's, it now, when I was going through his filmography, I thought, Oh yeah, Event Horizon, Star Wars, it all has this mm. very grimy, you know, lost in space feel to it. And again, like we were saying, nothing's, nothing's off the peg brand new. Nothing looks yeah. like it was just made yesterday. So I, I mean, the idea of uh, Star Wars is that Lucas wanted it to look like a dusty old Western. And that's why everything has its grime and so on. Because he wanted right. it to look like the frontier. I mean, John Mono had worked on, I think, The Charge of the Light Brigade. That was his first kind of sizable film so it really was a complete jump and it was just because he was the man available and obviously when they're first making the first Star Wars film they didn't know what a big thing it would be uh, so he was just a man kicking around and he's been pretty honest about a lot of them looked down on this kind of weird big episode of Doctor Who they thought they were making um, right yeah. That, yeah that general look of everything stripped down everything a bit dirty it's very iconic right yeah, no, it, it was a lot of fun revisiting it. I'm going to have to go through, go through more. I still haven't seen the last one. Have you? Uh, I've seen all of them. Uh, I love the originals. Um, dare I say it on a podcast? I absolutely love the prequels. Um, yeah, no, I love the, the Disney prequels. films. Oh wow! Yes. <laughs> no, I, I took up karate because I saw the prequels. That was oh. how influential they were on me back in the day. Wow. Um, yeah, I'm, I love them. I watched them, rewatched them. Uh, the Disney films, not so much, but then The Mandalorian has, has saved everything. Uh, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm completely sold on that. I've watched every episode multiple times. How yeah. is Carl Weathers in The Mandalorian? That's the only thing that would probably pull me in. Solid. <laughs> Solid. <laughs> is, he, is he in it a lot? I hesitate. Um, in, in the earlier seasons, he's in it more. Uh, they get right. away from that planet. So, uh, so, I have to say, if you're watching for Carl Weathers, that might not be the <laughs> thing. But hey... Hey, well, he's then, in it. He's in it. It's a I star would, turn. I would watch it in a heartbeat, but it just means another subscription. It means I've got to sign up to Disney. Oh, and, uh, okay. I'm like, I'm like, I've got to draw the line in the sand somewhere. I mean, you're on Prime, you're on Netflix, yeah. Sky, the BBC. And then, <laughs> I mean, you know, when's it end? Do you know what I mean? When's it fair end? enough, fair enough. Yeah, I think I know somebody who did their free trial so that they could watch all of The Mandalorian and then... Uh, Thank you. Goodbye. Oh, <laughs> well, maybe I can just go in for my my free trial, get my Carl Weathers fix, and then uh, borrow a friend's account or something. Yeah, kick it to the curb. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, Thomas, I got a I pulled an article off, article offline about uh, some of the stuff that's been sold on auction because I'm uh, getting a little bit glued to collectibles, memorabilia, mm. what stuff sells, and this article is about three or four years old. So I appreciate that there'll be other stuff out there that's more valuable and stuff like this that's even been sold has you know been tripled in price maybe since mm. um but before i get to this can you tell me if anything came up for auction now from the star wars new hope just the new hope mm -hmm. what would you be looking at what would you be putting your hand in your pocket for there is one item i pay any price for absolutely um it's an item you might you didn't see in the film but it's integral to the film uh, so we all remember Peter Cushing, Grandma Tarkin, all the Imperial officers wear these big black boots that really adds to the overall look. Peter Cushing had quite big feet. He's a very tall man. And Styles didn't have the budget uh, to give him like tailor-made boots. So he wore them for a day. They crushed his feet. And he asked George Lucas, could you please film me from the waist up? I don't want to close up. I just don't want to wear these, these, these shoes that are crushing me. So for the rest of the film, he wore slippers. <laughs> so for me, wow, Grand Moff Tarkin walking around the Death Star in these, I imagine, fluffy slippers. That's what I want. I want the fluffy uh, slippers from the Death Star. <laughs> <laughs> what a deep pool. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> that's nutty. If you, it, I thought when you said I'd like to have something that's not in the film, I thought you were going to say the missing words when Vader says, I felt something, something I haven't felt since and then walks away, uh, dot, 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 dot. Yeah. So there must be something that... Da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah, Lucas hasn't written the prequels then, yeah. so yeah. Maybe, Quick reach, what am I going to write? <laughs> I, I just think, uh, I think he, he just forgot, basically. <laughs> uh, forgot that line, doesn't matter. On to the next scene. 
<laughs> yeah. So or so yeah. I think I mean I'd I'd have to have Han Solo's trousers because like I say I was looking at them on uh, Magnolia Clovius. I think they're going for about three hundred bucks. But you have the yeah. trousers. I'll have the vest. I'll have to meet yeah. up wearing the trousers and the vest. So. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll do that. But I I was also thinking I wouldn't mind having the helmet where the guy twats himself as he comes in. One of the <laughs> the, the stormtroopers comes in and bangs his head on the on the door as he comes in. Right. So like, I think. I wouldn't mind having that helmet of the dude that twatted himself. <laughs> <laughs> that would be pretty good. Maybe one one's having a collection. So yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, good pulls. I love the slippers one though. I don't think I, I don't think I can top that. But just to give you an idea from this article of some of the stuff that's in, there's like thirty items. I'll go through just a few of them. Princess Leia's costume, the slave costume. I know we're jumping. This is Jedi now. I think isn't it Return of the Jedi? Yeah, but that famous slave costume that went for ninety six thousand US dollars and back in twenty fifteen. Um, I'm surprised how cheap it is given the the following that thing has. I know, right? and and I love the <laughs> fact that it says here it's uh, important version to have survived. It's now in private hands. You know that there's some dude is just getting his missus to wear that night and day. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that it's gone into some private hands. That's brilliant. Uh, oh, Obi Wan's cloak is here Ooh. so obi-wan's cloak when did that that was sold at bonhams in 2007 that reached 104,000. wow 104,000 for uh alec guinness's cloak there uh darth vader's helmet and shoulder <laughs> ready for this uh this is the empire strikes back one that sold for 110 grand that seems wow. really cheap but again, I am pulling this. I'm sorry, I didn't, uh, just to tell you how the fudge is packed here, I, I screwed up the times. I, was, I thought I was going to be on it at 6 p.m., and which would have been Thomas's 2 a.m. So uh, <laughs> I, I got it all backwards. So Thomas messaged me and goes, I'm good to go, ready when you are. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> so I didn't, have to, didn't do my usual prep. It's um, all had a show. It's <laughs> not, it's near had a show. Near had a show. Okay, near had a show. <laughs> So Vader's lightsaber that sold for 118 grand, pretty Oof. crazy. Um, yeah, I'm not you... expecting this to be in the millions. I'm, I'm like oh, expecting yeah. more that's noughts what... after this number. That's what I thought. I mean, I, again, it, it, it's probably gone up since. I know that as we speak, Prop Store are doing uh, a renewed Star Wars um, auction, and I'll, I'll leave I've links got in the one show. One thing on my bucket list is to go. There's a man called Stephen J. Sansweet, and he's the largest Star Wars collection in the world. And it's in California. Uh, he lives up, I think, in Marin County, California. And you can sometimes he will agree to show people around and he'll pull things out. And really? he has collected for so long. He, he literally collected Star Wars items from before the film came out. He was on the sci-fi circuit before. And they were selling the toys really early on and selling the novelization of the film even before the film came out. He just tried to promote the movie. And he got on then, and he was a general sci-fi collector, so this was like a weird thing he collected, and then it just took over. And he was the head of fan relations for a long, long time. Um, he's a really interesting man. Um, oh. and he has a lot of the original props. I bet he gets what emails. I bet he gets emails. His inbox must be <laughs> fucking crazy. It must be like Zerinsky's. <laughs> like, can you come on my show? Oh, yeah. Can you come on my podcast? Can I come see this? <laughs> oh, wow. What's his name funny, again? Uh, Sorry. Uh, Stephen J. Sansweet, and he right. literally wrote the Star Wars Encyclopedia. Uh, so that's his, yeah. his great work, his great contribution. Um, right. And there's a great video on YouTube where he's, he's from Marin County where Indian food is not so common. Uh, so they play a game with him. Is this the name of an obscure Star Wars character or the name of an Indian dish? <laughs> <laughs> he has to try and guess <laughs> which it is. Is biryani a Star Wars character or a dish? <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, that's that would get me every time. It'd make me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, is he? I'll have to have a look at some of those YouTube videos. But you say you say he only lets people in once in a while. You need the Willy Wonka yeah, ticket, really. Yeah, seems to, to be a thing. Right. Yeah, so I don't know what I've got to do to get one of those tickets. But, uh, uh, all well, I know is I'm going to do it. <laughs> well, maybe he's got the slippers. We'll have to uh, I'll tell you what, we'll send him Ooh. an email. We'll have a look. Hey, have you got the slippers? Can we come around and smell them? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> got some amazing stuff. He's got Luke Skywalker's seventh hand, I believe. Uh, really? Some of the at as well, yeah. So when it gets cut off, um, 
Uh, oh, I think of the head as well from the dream sequence. Yeah, he's got all kinds of really odd things. But again, he worked at Lucasfilm. So he's got some really strange props uh, wow. lying around. So, oh, that yeah. must be so cool to be there at the beginning of something. <laughs> Like absolutely. Like, can you imagine? Like, before Bond comes out, well, obviously, like you get Fleming books, I suppose. <laughs> you, yeah, that's, that's before Bond coming out. You'd get Ian Fleming <laughs> novels, but being around for that stuff, anyway. I always imagine, like, um, what is it? The the guy who wrote letters to Fleming saying, "Oh, Bond's using the wrong gun." Um, yeah, like Boothroyd, and then you get that's it. Boothroyd. Yeah, and so he gets written into the novels, and now he's Q and all that. So imagine what's uh, going like that. That would be so cool, yeah. Who would, We'd have to do that nowadays to someone like Anthony Horowitz. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but the internet's such a huge place now. Like You can't publish a book and have a mistake in it like nowadays, I guess. <laughs> well, anyway. But in a deliberate mistake, it becomes a collector's item. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like all the misspelling on like 20 Coke cans that went out in circulation. <laughs> nice. Well, Thomas, uh, oh, shall I do you uh, like a, a, I'll quickly do the top three. Quickly do the top okay. three. Well, a top four, actually, because someone's got an Imperial Stormtrooper costume, and this is the only one that I've seen online. Uh, featured in both the Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back, and it was given to a teenage member of an amateur dramatic society in 93. Uh, he worked on uh, as a pyrotechnician at Elstree Studios. That sold for $319,000. Wow. So, but that's, uh, that's 10 years ago. So that's at Christie's 10 years ago. So you imagine that's, that's easy. These things are investments, so that's the thing, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's that's pretty. I chip in here because there's a really interesting fact that for one of the season finale of The Mandalorian, they had loads and loads of stormtrooper costumes, but they didn't quite have enough. So what they did is they contacted the fan organization, the Five O First, and these are people who make their own costumes, dress up in them, and try and get them to film standard. And they actually brought the Five O First in. So what you see at the end is a whole bunch of Star Wars fans who've made their own costumes, and finally. They're in ah. one of the legit <laughs> Damn it, Thomas. You're gonna, come true. you're gonna make me sign up to bloody Disney at this rate. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you now. Uh, I'll have a hard uh, it'll be a hard sell for Anastasia. I mean, I only got to watch Star Wars because she was visiting her mum. <laughs> <laughs> How hard did you did you watch this recently or have you Yeah, yeah, I've uh, yeah. watched all of them recently. Um so how hard is it for you to watch Star Wars and not imagine Family Guy Star Wars? <laughs> oh, to be honest, that's not my favorite uh, take on it. I, I really like the Robot Chicken one, which is a, a much darker and much dorkier version of it. What is that? Uh, a Robot Chicken is an American um, late night show, I think. And one of their skits is where they reveal that Darth Vader can't really choke people. They just pretend because otherwise Darth Vader will cut people in half with his lightsaber. So they just pretend to get strangled, fall on the floor, get taken away, and then come back with a fake moustache. And then they point <laughs> to one guy, yeah, this guy's been strangled like 15 times. <laughs> <laughs> Is that just to cater to his ego? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they know right. he's angry, he knows he's going to try and kill him somehow, but uh, there's probably ways he can kill them, but he thinks he can do the choke thing. Truth is, he can't. Nice, I love that. That's pretty warped. That's pretty good. Well, the, the Family Guy one, I always think of, especially when Luke goes out and looks at the two suns or the two moons in the sky and he uh, goes, ladies and gentlemen, the John Williams Orchestra. <laughs> it's just airplane. I love that. Oh, man. Anywho. Right. Well, uh, Thomas, uh, you have a hard out, so I'll let you get on with your evening. Thanks again for taking us down memory lane with star wars people can catch you over at fleming never dies on instagram but also your own podcast british culture yeah. albion never dies available on all platforms how's that going for you oh yeah yeah I, i'm to be honest i'm just enjoying it there's no plan behind this i'm interviewing random people and asking them what is britishness um and i've asked a few people who are like british expats myself so i'm living in china and there's one guy who's been living in small chinese cities for like seven eight years uh, nine years now sorry um and his take on british culture is really really interesting and then i asked a few people like british people living in britain and recently asked uh, chris morales that one bond guy who's an american uh, who's been to the uk uh, once but he yeah he had a really interesting take too so yeah i'm just trying to answer for myself what is what is this thing called yeah nice well in relation to star wars it's pretty much everything right i mean i yes. I, I think david prouse you know he was the green cross code guy here in the uk i mean that it's 
you know, it doesn't get yeah. any more British than the Green Cross <laughs> Code guy becoming Darth Vader and never actually having a line to say. I mean, bless him, he was <laughs> dubbed. He was again, dubbed but... in both. He was. It's not his voice as Green Cross Code. It's not his voice as Darth Vader. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> that's all? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, you can watch the original. Uh, you, oh, I think it's on YouTube again. You can watch um, Darth Vader not dubbed, and he's got his thick West Country accent. Yeah, he sounds a bit different in real life. So that's Britishness to me. That is, uh, other than Bradley Wiggins sideburns, David Prowse not having a line to say in uh, Star Wars is the epitome of Britishness. But they didn't even tell him the big plot twists, you know. Uh, they were frightened that he'd blab to go down the pub and drink and stuff, and, and they were frightened he'd blab, so they didn't even tell him some of the lines. Like the oh, most really? iconic line he found out when he watched in the cinema, like everyone else. That's nutty. That's nutty. Yeah. Well, he, he, had he, a didn't, dummy line. he didn't get on with Lucas, right? Because yeah. he, I don't know what happened, but I think he, he, he was cashing in quite a bit, wasn't he, David Prowse? Yeah. Um, and and the rumor always was he just talked too much. He said what was going on in the film. He'd be down the pub with his mates. That's that's what Lucasfilm always said. And and he felt yeah that he'd kind of maybe cashed in too early. So right. Well, that's Britishness, mate. That is. He's, going he down has the been pub knighted, and telling so. your mates. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's pretty much it. Bless him. Not around anymore, is he? No, no. I Recently, he away. yeah. Yeah, but uh, but he was knighted for his work for the British Heart Foundation. So. And he's got a tremendous CV, right? He trained at Christopher Reeve to be Superman. That's right. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's something crazy. for a CV, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you're never going to have a problem finding work if that's on your CV. Yeah. And then Christopher Reeve was the best Superman. will always be the best Superman, yeah. right? I don't care who comes along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Agreed. 